Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today. It is lovely to see all of you this morning. A special welcome to our bell choir this morning. Um, a few announcements to draw your attention to. Um, got a little bit of a sniffle, so I'll be wearing my mask throughout worship and during fellowship today. Um, everything has gone out in the midweek blast. I encourage you to please continue to check out those announcements, both the Sunday announcements and the midweek blast announcements. They're all available in the narthex if you don't have those. And then um, I will be out of the office tomorrow, but if anything arises, Anita will be available to help assist you. And then also today, we are celebrating National Quilt Sunday, and we are also supporting our youth in between services. So our wonderful quilters have set up um, a bunch of their quilts, and we'll be inviting you to come in and see what that process is, right? We talk about the quilts, we talk about our quilters, we talk about everything that they do. And if you're like, what does that actually entail? Now is a fantastic time to learn, and you will be invited to help to tie the quilts together. Um, it really is as simple as kind of poking the, the thread through and tying it off. And then also our youth are getting, we're getting ready for some, um, some things to do with our Sunday school kids, including an Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday. And Tina would really appreciate our support in helping to stuff all those eggs. It takes way more time to do that than it does for the kids to find all of them. So if you could go and spend some time with our quilters and spend some time just hop in, hop, pun intended, hop into the nursery to help stuff a few Easter eggs, um, that would be wonderfully appreciated. With that, dear ones, I invite you to turn your hearts and minds to worship as our bell choir calls us to worship this morning. <clears throat>
Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able as we continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, who makes all things new, and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We'll take a moment of silence before we continue. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you with all honor and mercy by what you have done and by what you have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. I invite you to please turn to hymn number 339 as we sing our opening hymn.
our prayers before Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts, and anoint us with your Spirit, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, beginning at the first verse. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. <clears throat> Fill your horn with oil and set up. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehem, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill you. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema passed by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read the psalm responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, and the meat me to the Lord. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the eighth verse. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, sleep or awake. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
very long reading this morning. A lot of big readings from John this Lenten season. Our Holy Gospel today is according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how is, can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The religious leaders did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son? Who, was, who you say was born blind? How then does he see now? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it was that, that now he sees, nor we, do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the religious leaders, for they had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. I answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and he is the one speaking with you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Beloveds of God, grace and peace to you in the name of the Holy One. Amen. I think I've talked before about the TV show, The Good Place. Right? The premise of this, this show is that all the characters have died and gone to the good place, i.e. heaven, through a series of wonderfully constructed twists and turns, the characters reach a point where they are trying to figure out the point system for determining where someone will go when they die. Good deeds, good works, good things are weighted differently to get you to the good place, and Bad deeds, bad works, and bad things are also weighted differently and will send you to the bad place. Ultimately, the idea is that good people will go to the good place and bad people will go to the bad place. And it will all be figured out equitably and fairly and everyone will literally get what they have earned. Now it's a TV show, so lots of twists and turns and unexpected reveals for that storyline. But it made me think of what we read in our gospel today, where the disciples respond to the man's disability by asking whose sin was he paying for? Whose bad deeds were the points that had added up to make him be blind as a punishment for those bad deeds? Now, before we go any further, I want to define what I mean when I say sin. Within our Lutheran tradition, we believe that sin is our broken relationship with God and that anything that causes that brokenness is sin. Our theology does not treat sin as a question of morality, but rather of relationship. Now this fits with what sin is in the Gospel of John. Caroline Lewis writes that John's gospel categorizes sin not as a moral issue, but rather as a relational issue. She argues that to be in sin or to sin is to not be in relationship with God, not to believe that God is present in the word made flesh. Which brings us to the beginning of this passage. In the ancient world, it was a long-held belief that illness was a punishment for sin. Now Jesus immediately re rejects that interpretation as he reframes and reinterprets sin and sinning. By rejecting the belief that this man's blindness was due to an ancestral sin, Jesus once again makes space for God's work, God's actions, God's grace 
to abound. But Jesus doesn't deny the reality of sin. When his disciples ask him about sin, he does what he usually does. He <laughs> takes the expected answer and he expands it in the lights of who he is as God's beloved son. He reframes our understanding of sin by confronting it. The <laughs> sin of rejecting one sent by God. So when Jesus restores this man's sight, I don't think the takeaway is supposed to be that blindness is bad or that disability needs to be fixed. Jesus points to the true sin, the true brokenness, is the hard-heartedness of everyone else in this passage. Because the people who are supposed to be the most open to God, the most able to recognize or to see God at work in their midst, are the ones who are the most stubborn to the point of driving this man out of the synagogue. They are so blinded by their prejudices and their ideas of the right and only right way of things that they cannot, will not, and they refuse to see just what God is truly capable of accomplishing. This man's neighbors, people who have known him from birth, his religious leaders, even his parents, are all so focused on how the miracle could happen that they lose sight of what Jesus said God was doing here so that God's work might be revealed in him. That was back in verse 3. Every time someone in the text tries to focus on the actual healing, right, the man born blind is now able to see with his eyes. It's the ones who see the most clearly who end up shifting the conversation. The work of restoring vision is about God's revelation through Jesus Christ. God invites us to be witnesses to see God's work in the world, to see all that God has done, is doing, and will do, and to be a part of that work. To be willing to unsee all that binds us and holds us back from abiding fully in Christ. To invite God to heal our own unwillingness to see the depth and breadth and height of God's extraordinary grace. One of the big things happening in this gospel is that Jesus ultimately commissions a new apostle. Apostle means a person sent forth. Jesus sends him to Siloam, which means sent. And he commissions this new apostle from a group that would have always always been on the receiving end of charity. His already gathered apostles do not see this man as a potential partner in God's work, but rather as someone meant to receive their pity and their charity and be the focus of their theological discussions of what is right and what isn't, right? All in the theoretical rather than in the doing. The miracle at work here isn't just that the man born blind can now see, but that Jesus breaks the bonds of spiritual and emotional blindness and brings his community of believers to a place of far greater clarity. God's work is the healing, yes, absolutely, but also something much broader and much deeper. I don't know about you, but I found myself convicted by this. I don't know that I initially saw this man as a fellow disciple in the kingdom of God, but rather as someone who I felt bad for and I was happy he could see again. And yet, years of growing my various professional and personal circles have taught me that rejoicing and being restored to the quote unquote normal doesn't make me a good person. It doesn't earn me good points. Because 
It's not that anyone with a disability is broken and imperfect in their disability. People aren't only worthy of God's perfect love if they are healed of that imperfection. Caroline Lewis writes that in John's story, the very person widely thought to be sinful turns out to be a worthy apostle. And the very people thought to be righteous turn out to be captive to the contemptuous, oblivious, exclusionary ways of sin. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. God's mercy, grace, and abundant life do not depend on our goodness or our works because we have been saved by grace through faith alone. We can never earn enough points because there are no points to earn. God invites us to be attentive to where God is at work in our world and in our lives. To abide so fully in him that we learn to see God's ways. Learn to see as God sees. Not with the outward appearance of imperfection or brokenness or size or gender or race or what have you. But to see what God sees, which is our hearts. God sees our hearts, and he still loves us. To be a, so fully abiding in Christ that the light of the world reveals everything. That God's love heals all the ways in which we are blind to God's ways. It is God's love that heals us, restores us, and makes us able to see all that God has done, is doing, and will continue to do. To be invited into the work of seeing and to be a part of God's way of abundant and everlasting life. Thanks be to God. Amen. <coughs>
confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the Spirit. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge us with him.
receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Jesus Christ, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Come Holy Spirit. Spirit. Reveal, to, reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth burning with justice peace and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with the sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Gathered together as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the light is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and receive Jesus, our strength in the wilderness. All are welcome at the table. Please be seated.
say with us from home, this is the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you. I invite you to please rise as you are able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Embodied God, at your table we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. Amen. As we go now from this time of worship, God goes with us and before us, <coughs> helping us to abide in him and to see the world with the eyes of his love. And he sends us now with this blessing. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. We sing our sending hymn number 793, Be Thou My Vision. 